and welcome to Broadway First Baptist Church. For the past 17, 117 years, we have been meeting between Portage Avenue and the shore, North Shore of the Assiniboine River. We're tucked into the Wolseley neighborhood, in the middle of Winnipeg, and the heart of Canada. This is your home church, and it's good to be together. We're coming to you live, Zoom, and then YouTube. So, we've got you covered. One of the things I do on the weekend is I make coffee and I paddle my boat with the waters of both Treaties 3 and Treaty 1. And I was reminded also of Treaty Land as I passed from Treaty 2 to Treaty 5 on my drive to Beset this week. And even though I think of this Treaty Land and water fairly regularly, it's good when I'm up here once a month or so to put this gratitude into words. And uh, this water and this land was a gift from God to the First Nations and the Métis Nation that were here before us. And we acknowledge these treaties this morning. I've got a few announcements this morning. Um, quick word on our alarm system. Anybody who comes in here after hours or is the first one in here may notice that it says a communication error. And uh, the alarm is functioning perfectly. But if you've used our phone, you might also notice that it is terribly crackly. And that seems to be creating some sort of issue that prevents AAA from talking to Bell. Same company and everything, but uh, there's an issue there. So uh, my work schedule has been preventing me to have the follow-up meeting with Bell here at the church so that they can correct the issues. And uh, I hope to have that happening soon. But if this isn't the issue, which is why I'm bringing this up, if it's not a phone issue, we may have to replace our alarm system here. Uh, Charlene is taking some well-deserved time off. Uh, she started that time off on Tuesday by meeting with me to talk about church business. Uh, her time off, time off actually started after last week's church service and it ends on Monday the 20th and then she brings us the sermon next week. And I'm, even though Susan's not here, I'm giving a kickoff, a kickstart to announcement that Connections deadline is coming up in a couple of weeks. Now I want to bring that up because I have uh, some uh, speaker scheduling to do, so I have to get that to her. So I'm just really outlining this for myself, but in case any of you others need to get your head into gear that things are coming back, uh, remember Connections. Thank you also for your continued financial support of this Christian community here at Broadway. So much of what we do is made possible by these gifts. And we, although we haven't taken up a physical offering since before COVID, uh, the way that people have has given has changed. So um, please continue to give as you're able through e-transfers or physical donations up here on this mini pew. Next week's service will be led by Pastor Charlene, <clears throat> and in two weeks, Clark Geets will be joining us to bring us the message. Uh, August is an interesting month. And then uh, this morning's message is brought to us by Heather McCumber, who is over here, 
And I, I'm going to introduce her before her sermon, but um, let's leave it to say that it's nice to have you with us here today. And now as we transition into our worship service, I have a question. And is time flying as much for you as it is for me? We're halfway through August, and it seems like just the other day I mentioned something about the summer solstice on June 21st. And a lot of what I was looking forward to this summer is now behind us. And um, I hear that the deacons are meeting this week, which means that their end of the summer break has come to an end here. Uh, we also have to start planning for fall worship service. Any day now, I'm expecting the bell tables to return up here, which means we're going to have to look at our setup over here as well. And uh, there's talk about back to school. And when I was at Superstore yesterday, there were chip boxes with Halloween stuff on it. And I'm not 100% sure what I'm about to say next, but I'm going to say it anyway. At 100 kilometers an hour, I'm not, a, I'm not really sure what I saw, but the road to Beset Thursday, I'm pretty sure I saw some leaves changing colors. I don't know what comes after green with these ones, but it looked like that was in process. And none of this is said to make you feel anxious. It's said to assure you that you are not alone in feeling that time is flying. So I've been looking for a spot to drop a reference as I was preparing for today, a reference to Robbie Robertson who died this week, and, uh, or last week. And he sang some beautiful advice to us that went, don't let the rapture pass you by. It was part of the chorus to a song called Soapbox Preacher. Don't let the rapture pass you by. In other words, don't lose sight of what's really important. The distractions of our busy lives can keep us from seeing the constant and unchanging perfection of the God who made us all. So for our time together, let's forget about all these distractions and how fast time is going. And let's forget about the rest of our week for this time that we're together. We're here to bring encouragement to one another and to worship God. And God is here. Are you? So let's begin our worship by singing together.
Heavenly Father, I just thank you today that you are the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We just worship you and we thank you for that beautiful song, Lord, and one day we'll be worshiping you forever. Yes. What a sight that will be. I thank you, Lord. I lift up before you our church today, Broadway First Baptist, and I thank, <clears throat> thank you for everyone who's part of this church. <clears throat> and I pray that you would meet them, show them how real you are, that all their needs would be met physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I pray that we would all be conduits of your love to a broken world in our neighborhood, at work or in the marketplace, in our neighborhood. Pray for all those who are shut in or who may be unwell at this time, that you would touch them, Lord. Pray for our church community today, Lord, and all the people that walk by our church, Lord. I pray that they'd have a sense that we are people that care about them, Lord, and that people would be interested in coming to our church, oh God. Draw new people to our church, we ask. I pray also for the wars that are still ongoing, Lord, and that they would cease, so oh Lord. Um, this time I want to read a scripture in Psalm 2. It's just in Psalm 2, verse 8, and it says, Ask me, and I will make the nations of your inheritance. The nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. And Lord, we claim that verse today, and we say, Lord, that Lord, that we would make the nations your our inheritance. So God, we would we just claim these people for you, Lord. All these people, Lord, who are think of the war in Ukraine and that the ceasefire would be accomplished that you would comfort and strengthen all the families that are separated, that they would know you are a father to the fatherless. I pray, O oh God, for all the families that are separated too, Lord, uh, that are in other countries, while their husbands or fathers are at war. <clears throat> I pray for our government today, Lord, that you would give wisdom to the and godly counsel to those ruling over us in our city, our province, and our nation. Pray for those government leaders who are Christians that they would be courageous, bold, and loving as they re represent their writings all over the country. And where there's fires today, Lord, in BC or anywhere else in the country, that you would protect the firefighters and bring these fires to an end. Bring rain to these places, O oh God, we pray. We lift up the Trudeau family today as they experienced a separation in their family. And we pray that you would help them to turn their hearts to you, Lord, at this time. Lord, we pray for uh, the church service as we uh, continue on today and bless the, us as we listen that we would be people that would be not only hearers of your word but doers of your word also. We thank you Lord in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you, Harvey. <clears throat> uh, just before Heather comes up to uh, give her message to us this morning, I'm gonna, I'd like to do a little introduction. Uh, first of all, welcome again. Uh, Heather was referred to us by Mark Dirksen, and uh, we started communication barely a month ago. I had to look back on that email, and it really wasn't that long ago, so uh, 
I would consider that a short notice here, so thank you for coming so quickly here. Uh, Heather works at Providence Divinity Colleges, but comes to us from Ontario, including Hamilton and Ottawa, uh, Hamilton and Toronto. Is that right, Toronto? All three. All three, okay, so take, the reason I'm pointing that out is I'm looking at the camera so I can uh, tell Bob and Carol Barber to please take note of that connection there. So I'm gonna read what's posted on Providence's website about Heather. Dr. McCumber teaches courses predominantly in the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible. Her research interests include the intersection of the divine and earthly spheres, monstrous bodies, and biblical art. Her recent book, Recovering the Monstrous in Revelation, applies the interdisciplinary method of monster theory to John's apocalypse. And then drilling a little deeper, uh, a title of a work in progress really caught my attention. So in a collected volume, she has something called Apocalyptic Elements in Stranger Things in Theology, Religion, and Stranger Things. That's, uh, I'm, I really like the sounds of that. <laughs> One day maybe we'll know more about that. And is this work still in process? I'm literally working. Fantastic. Keep going, please. So Heather today is going to be speaking to us about Leah, and she's got some slides that are coming from her history in biblical art. And uh, thank you for coming in from Grunthal this morning to lead us. Heather. All right, so uh, let us begin with a reading uh, from God's Word. We're in the book of Genesis, chapter 29. I'm going to start us off at verse 16. We're right in the middle of the narrative, but you might know this story. So here we go. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. <coughs> Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you, speaking to Laban, seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, Give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. Remember, seven whole years. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah, and Jacob said to Laban, What is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the, before the firstborn. Complete the, work, the week of this one, and we will give you the other one also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. It says here in brackets, Laban gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel to be her maid, bracket. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. He served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. For she said, because the Lord has looked on my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I'm hated and has given me the son also. And she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived and bore a son and said, now this time my husband will be joined to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore, he was named Levi. She conceived again and bore a son and said, This time I will praise the Lord. Therefore she named him Judah. Then she ceased bearing. All right. So you may be familiar with that story. It's one that is often told in Sunday school. 
I'm not sure why. It's a little interesting as a children's selection. Um, but today I want to flip the script for you. We're going to look at the story from a different angle. So I'm very happy to be here with you today. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to a little bit of reading the Bible with and through art as a different medium of rereading and re-examining a story you might know very well. So I'm hoping my slides are up here or will be coming up soon. Um, I do have some slides and some artwork for you. All right, so I was recently asked to curate an exhibit for the visual commentary on scripture. Um, you may not have heard of this, but it's an online platform that connects the Bible with artistic interpretation and commentary. So basically what they've done is they want the entire Bible to be up online, and then each section or each story, they're going to link it with artwork. And that artwork is going to be by pastors, by academics, by artists, theologians, to write a bit about each painting, and then a larger essay connecting them. And it's all free online. So I did one on Leah, and I'm actually commissioned to do one on Ruth as well. And the text I received was Genesis chapter 29, which I read for you right now, which is the rather infamous story of Jacob who was duped by his father-in-law Laban into marrying the wrong sister. And we all have questions, which I will not answer today, about how Jacob is tricked so badly. But I really enjoy reading and teaching a story with my students because it really helps us to see some of our biases when we come to the biblical text and some of our preconceived ideas of what is there. Often, we hear the word bias and we might take a step back because we assume the worst implications from it. But usually when I talk about bias, I want to really get at the idea of what do we bring to the text? What about our culture, our background, our previous learning are we bringing into the text that may not actually be there? And so usually this reading that we bring to the text becomes the reading, right? A capital T-H-E, the reading, which makes us blind to some other possibilities. And sometimes we assume details in the text that are not actually there, but they become part of our culture experience of telling the story. So they become part of our artwork, they become our, our songs, our Sunday school material. And it's not until you dig deep into the scripture that you realize, I don't see it there. So I wanted today to give the example of the relationship between Jacob, Rachel, and Leah, which is viewed in popular culture, and I would even argue in the church, as a bit of a love triangle. So if you're familiar with the love triangle scenario in popular culture, this is the classic one. Jacob loves Rachel, Rachel loves Jacob, but Leah, who also happens to be the sister, also loves Jacob. But again, Jacob does not love Leah, right? It's messy. And then it's so messy, it gets even worse because as you add into the situation, you have Laban, uh, who is actually giving to Jacob, to, to both his wives, two enslaved women as maids. And you know later on the story, they become part of this messy triangle. Now, we have four women and one husband. This is going to be an issue later on. Today, we're not going to focus on that part as much. But I want to back up and I want to ask the question, is this a love story? Who do we sympathize with? Traditionally, interpreters favor Jacob and Rachel, seeing them as the principal couple and often criticizing Leah because of her looks. Now, I read from the NRSV translation, which mentioned she had beautiful eyes. The Hebrew is dicey here. It could mean she's got beautiful eyes or weak eyes or that she's just plain old ugly. Like there's just, we don't actually know what the Hebrew means, which your interpreters and your translators are just adding in their best guess here. Um, and so if you go into the commentaries, it's a best guess scenario. Um, and so what's happened over time is interpreters will take one or two routes. And so interpreters will take Rachel's side, usually because she's beautiful, she's lovely. And Leah tends to get marginalized in the text. And so if the text says she has weak or perhaps soft eyes in contrast to Rachel's beauty, that's one reason why she's looked down upon. Leah's role in the story is often dismissed and she is thought to hate her sister or even to be unattractively jealous of her sister because Rachel has more access to Jacob because of his love for Rachel. But over the years that I've taught this story, my students have actually come up with some really interesting observations. And one of those is that nowhere in the text do we hear that Rachel loves Jacob. Mm. We are told that Jacob loves Rachel, but we are never told that she actually loves him back. 
It's perhaps a small detail, but it's important to realize that the narrator is providing you this part of the story. We fill in the gaps, creating our own narratives, whether we realize it or not. And we might disintend unintentionally having absorbed these interpretations through years of sermons, through Bible studies, through Sunday school, through songs, through paintings, it's all over. But today, I want to look at some what artists are doing with this story. And they're quite deliberate in their portrayals. Often artists will take a moment that's messy in scripture, where there's a bit of translation, we just don't quite know what it is, and they'll play with it. And that's what I want to look at with you today. And so the first painting I want to draw your attention to, and I'm, I'm hoping it's here by me. Excellent. If we can go to the next slide, that'd be perfect. Um, the first painting I want to draw your attention to is called Jacob Reproaching Laban. And it's by a Dutch artist named Hendrik Ter Bruggen uh, from the early 1600s. Now, this might be a painting you might pass by at the WAG or, you know, a National Art Gallery because, yeah, it's just a Bible painting. It's, you know, obviously it's not out of date. It's not an authentic biblical painting, but I think there's a lot here for us to look at. So our acts of interpretation start out quite quickly since this painting has no name originally. So your artist, for some reason, we've lost the name. And so interpreters over the century have given the name Jacob reproaching Laban. So already we are at an act of interpretation about who this painting is actually about. Now, I agree that this is probably that scene where everything comes to a head and Jacob is angry with his father-in-law. And again, we are biased a little bit, right? Because the title already tells us it's a reproach, right? This is a story between Jacob and between Laban. So one of my favorite courses to teach is Bible and the Arts, and I always instruct my students to start first with observing the painting. They want to move really fast to evaluating, to saying, I love this painting and I hate this painting, and I don't let them do that. They have to start first with evaluating or observing it, interpreting it along with the Bible, and then evaluating, did the artist do a fair job, a good job, an interesting job? Okay, so let's give this painting a moment to speak to us. And I'm gonna walk you through the process. If we're in a small group, I'd actually ask for your help, but I'll give you a few things that we can look at. All right, so let's start with the male figures because this is what our title is biasing us towards. So we'll look at Jacob and Laban. And we might notice these two men seem to be arguing with each other, right? Their body language is aggressive. They're pointing at each other. Um, and we see that there's a woman who's caught in the middle, right? Right there in the middle and she is being ignored by both of them. They're speaking across her. On the table behind, we see there's a meal. It seems to be interrupted, right? There's a piece of bread there. There's cutlery that's kind of scattered. Interestingly, Jacob, who we are, even because of the way we read scripture, because of the way the painting has set us up, we expect Jacob to be the main character. And yet, you might notice his face is in shadow. We can't see his expression and we can't see his face. And also, we see this elderly figure who's seated there. But if we step back for a moment and we look at the painting as a whole, and I know it's a little small, you can feel free to look it up on your phone, uh, we might notice that there's a shepherd's crook or there's some kind of like rod that he's holding. And it's dividing the painting in two. And I find this really interesting, that diagonal line. And it's, it actually what it's doing is separating, I think, the two sisters. It not only separates the two male figures, it separates the two sisters. And so you can see that you have Jacob and this woman who's peeking around the corner, which is likely Rachel. And they seem to be somehow connected, right, by the way that the diagonal is going through the painting. And the other side, you have Laban and Leah, who are aligned with one another. And then finally, our artist, Ter Bruggen, has Jacob and Leah in brighter clothes, which actually, I would argue, is helping them to stand out in the painting. While Rachel, who's kind of off in the corner, right, usually she's the main character. She seems to be in the background in this painting, and Laban seems to be receding. But Jacob and Leah are the ones we're focused on. So I find Ter Bruggen's painting really interesting because the artist intentionally is focusing on Leah. And it's hard to find paintings that do this. The paintings always focus on Rachel. They always focus on Jacob, but not Leah. And I think he does this in a couple ways. As I said, Jacob's face is shadowed and Rachel is hidden. Leah, though, stands out as the light. And again, in art, we always look at where the light falls, but the light is falling directly on her face. And if you look at her expression, 
it's arresting, right? We can't stop looking at it. We want to know, what are you thinking about? Everyone is yelling. Everyone is arguing. What is going on in your mind right now? So even though the other characters are ignoring her, I want to know what she's thinking. The stillness of her posture also isolates her because everyone else is in movement, right? Rachel's peeking. She's actively listening. The two men are arguing. And we have the still figure. Jacob and Laban are depicted leaning towards each other as well, where she's just kind of like the straight up and down vertical figure. And so Leah's motionlessness in the picture disengages her from her immediate surroundings. And it's inviting us to think a little deeper about her story. So Ter Bruggen has not only pushed Leah to the forefront, but I would argue he's also silencing Jacob and Laban, which is interesting, right? Because in the painting they're arguing, but I think Ter Bruggen is silencing them in favor of highlighting Leah and her distress as being a rejected wife. This is the morning after her wedding. This is not the time when you want to find out your husband hates you. We want to know what she's thinking, and we want to know how she's feeling. And it makes me wonder if Ter Bruggen would have chosen the title, Jacob Reproaching Laban, or would he have said, Leah being rejected the day after. So as noted earlier, readers are often dismissive of Leah and focus more on this supposed love story between Jacob and Rachel. And Ter Bruggen's deliberate emphasis on the figure of Leah challenges this interpretation by suggesting she's maybe not as passive a person as we think she is. But what's even more interesting is that Leah, in the biblical text, receives a lot of attention. And I don't think we actually realize this. And this takes a form of an extended dialogue with God. And so in my reading at the end, you may have noticed back and forth, she's talking straight to God, right? She's praying to God. We hear her innermost thoughts. In biblical narrative, we don't often get people's thoughts. We get their actions. But here we get a, just a glimpse into her soul even. And I would argue that these types of prayers that we are hearing from Leah are similar to the laments of the Book of Psalms. And I'm not sure how much you've worked on laments or talked about laments, but they are all over scripture. They saturate the Book of Psalms, Jeremiah, the Book of Job is one massive lament. Laments are complaints to God for perceived or real justice in your life. And they are complaints, they are basically yelling and shouting at God when life goes wrong. And so these are a major way that the Jewish people would communicate with their God. And if you know laments, you know they move from complaint to praise. That is the movement, except for one song. One ends in complaint. And so we get this moment in Genesis of this access to her sense of alienation and rejection from Jacob. And after the birth of her son Reuben, she says, Because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, surely now my husband will love me. Or later, the birth of Simeon, we hear, because the Lord has heard that I am hated. Her complaints center on her status as hated, and her prayers are acts of trust for God to intervene in her situation. And it's easy to skim over these verses, right, to get to the action, to find out what happens with Jacob. But I think it's amazing that this woman gets so much space in this narrative given to the worries and suffering of a woman that church tradition has often overlooked. So as I said earlier, it's hard to find paintings of Leah. They don't really exist uh, because artists have glanced over it. It's not interesting enough. And so the second part of my work on the visual commentary in scripture is to find some more paintings. And it's hard when they don't really exist. And so one thing the visual commentary in scripture does is they ask its contributors to find art that has nothing to do with the Bible. So find a painting that has, was not intended to be read alongside the Bible and to see how you can speak and engage with the Bible. So my second painting, uh, if we can go to the next slide, thank you, is from Ghislaine Howard, who is a uh, British artist from the 1980s. And this one is called Study for Self-Portrait. Now, this is not Leah. This is nothing to do with the Bible. This is a self-portrait of the artist during her own pregnancy. Uh, and so I chose this because I thought it would be very generative and enlightening to talk about Leah and her role as a mother and as a pregnant woman throughout scripture. And so I wanted to really, the artist here, she made a whole series of self-portrait in the 1980s. And they're rather uh, 
like, like they're forerunners in a way. There's not a lot in art history of women being pregnant. Oftentimes artists would, uh, if a, a person wanted their portrait done in the 1700s, they would just not paint in the pregnancy, right? It wouldn't be included in the self-portrait. And so it's not always easy even to find pregnancy in art. And so Ghislaine Howard though, she is here showing pregnancy in its most honest form. Um, the physical and emotional experience that I thought complemented Leah's story. So again, let's make some observations. We can see here the woman's figure dominates the frame. There's not much background, right? It's just this portrait of this woman. And her gaze is pointed downward. I think if anyone has had children or walked alongside someone who has had children, you can sense her tiredness, her exhaustion um, as she's slouched over. And like Jacob's face in the earlier painting, her features are in shadow, right? It's hard to recognize her. She could be anyone. And there's still a sense of sadness here. And I do want to say here, in terms of a trigger warning, in terms of pregnancy and pregnancy loss, is the stories in Genesis not only celebrate having children, but also walking through people who've experienced loss as well. Um, they both, I think these are really powerful stories for people and families today. So there's nothing defining or unique about this woman in the text. Even the background is simple. As I said, she could be anyone. And I felt that the timeless character of Howard's own portrait of her pregnancy would be really helpful to look at Leah's portrait of her experience in Genesis. And so you may have seen other portraits of pregnancy in the media in recent years. Beyonce is pretty famous for it. Demi Moore made headlines, I think, in the 1990s for her pregnancy portraits. But those celebrated the female form, right? Like the fertility of the female body. Here, it's the exhaustion. It's honest and raw and authentic. And Tara Bruggen, um, we saw how he used light to expose Leah. But here, Howard does it to shroud it. So we have really different feelings in these paintings where Leah is highlighted and here there's a bit of darkness on her face. Howard's self-portrait is a reminder of the everyday invisible lives of women whose interior struggles are not often acknowledged or preserved. Um, and the real suffering of Leah and Rachel is often reduced to jokes or being mocked by interpreters. Even if you pick up really good commentaries by good scholars, they can't help but make jokes. I mean, even I did today, right, about that day after. It's ripe for humor, and yet we forget the suffering that's embedded in this text. We, they often find the rivalry that continues in the next chapter between the sisters to be humorous, slightly ridiculous. But I find it curious that Leah's prayers in chapter 29 that I read to you don't go unnoticed by God. God hears and answers her laments repeatedly. He takes her seriously. Not everything is resolved, but even in this messy family situation, the narrator is clear to show how God is present in this family. These observations and reflections only scratch the surface, but I hope they reveal to you a more complicated Leah that you might, than you might have encountered before. Admittedly, the Bible does not always reflect the lives of women. It was news to me to discover there are no psalms dedicated to matters specific to women. There's nothing about the fear over childbirth or pregnancy loss or even the violence experienced by women in our psalms collection. But here in Genesis 29, we do have an incredible moment where we hear Leah's voice and her pain. However, it's too often glossed over as readers are more interested in Jacob's story and the opportunities that are missed. Artwork itself is an interpretive choice. So you can clearly see, um, if we go to the Terra Bruggen, which is the next slide, uh, you can obviously see in Terra Bruggen's painting that this is a Dutch background. This is not biblically accurate. And yet, we know that. We can understand the bias that the artist brought to his artwork. But we don't always see the bias that we bring to the Bible. We don't always know our lenses. We're not aware of them. And so this clues us automatically that maybe we need to start thinking about what we bring to the Bible. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I actually think it's a really positive thing. We each bring something to the readings. We each enliven the scriptures as the Spirit meets us in reading it. And we also forget sometimes there are multiple ways of approaching these stories. I mean, when we sit around in Bible study, we all realize we have different ideas and perspectives. But sometimes we forget that maybe we should shift our focus from Jacob to Leah. Maybe we should read it from Laban's uh, perspective one time. Maybe that would be an interesting perspective. 
The biblical text is amazingly resilient and allows us this freedom to approach it with new eyes. Leah is a character worth considering. She speaks to anyone that has felt alienated from family or from society. She allows us a chance to glimpse her pain and suffering, but also to experience the hope she has with the birth of each new child. And although she's ignored by her father and her husband, she's acknowledged repeatedly by God, who intervenes in her situation. We see in her prayers that her faith in God strengthens despite her ongoing marital difficulties and issues with her sister. And so as we read these stories, the stories we choose to read, the stories we choose to teach, to preach, these shape our understandings of the world. They shape our understandings of who we are in community to one another. God and later Jesus seem to take extra care to notice and interact with the women in their circles, right? Even on the periphery of society. And I was surprised also to find out that Rachel and Leah's story is not forgotten. If you ever read through the end of the book of Ruth, you find out uh, that both Leah and Rachel are upheld as kind of pillars of Israel. They're the founding mothers of Israel. And the people tell Boaz, Ruth's new husband, that we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. And I find it interesting here that the Jewish people remember both sisters, not just Rachel, the beautiful one, but also Leah, the one who was hated. And they are both acknowledged for their role in founding the house of Israel. So flipping the script and peering into the dusty corners of scripture can bring great rewards. There is great comfort in witnessing the lives of these ancient women whose stories continue to speak to us. And so I saw the next song is Great is Thy Faithfulness. So as you sing this song, as you worship, think about the faithfulness of these women, the faithfulness of the saints that have gone before. Oh 
And now your benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen. Oh.